Evening. Uh, hello again. Uh, I'm Tim Mendes. Uh, tonight I'm going to be reading you a story from the brand new, brand new released uh, anthology, It Caught from the Forest. Um, we've got some information on that. We are going to be, it's going to be 99 cents for the entire weekend as a special introductory offer. Uh, I don't know what that works out to in pounds and sterling, but it's going to be less than a quid. Uh, also, we have a uh, we have a giveaway, a prize giveaway for you lucky people. Um, all you need to do to enter is to comment below and tell us what scares you the most. Like anything. What phobias, anything. Just tell us what scares me the most is. And then um, and that enters you and then it will go into a hat and it will be open for 24 hours. Then after that time, there will be a winner. Okay, so tonight I'm going to read you a matter of recycling from It Calls from the Forest. Stuart dropped to his knees as the rain poured through the branches. His load had been heavy, and exhaustion racked his body. The storm that ripped through the woods outside of High Bend was gathering in ferocity. Patches of decaying autumnal leaves spun and whipped against his rain lashed face. Thunder crashed overhead as he raised his hands to the sky in supplication. Tears streamed down his face as he lamented, No more! You have had your fill. The groaning branches seemed to cackle at his defiance. He knew it wouldn't be as easy as that, and he could only watch as the process started to take hold of his unclean cargo. At that moment, all he could think of was an escape, some kind of release from the terrible compact he had unconsciously made with the woods. No solution was forthcoming. As a child, Stuart Fowler had spent many a happy day amongst the ancient trees and dense foliage. His grandmother had warned him of the things that lurked in the dark places of the woods, but he had paid no heed to her fanciful tales of, of the furtive things that stalked the undergrowth. It was just another of his granny's various quirks. She was known as something of an odd duck amongst the small village forever chattering about curses and unhallowed ground, a fact that did little to endear him to, to other children. Left with his eccentric grandparent at an early age, Stuart was always a shy and introspective youth. He had few friends growing up, since the local children were terrified of his witch grandmother. Instead of conventional friendship, Stuart had chosen the woods as his companion and he felt at ease amongst the creatures that called the trees their home. He was out there every day, rain or shine, living in his own little world. When one spends as much time as he did amongst the changing seasons and the life or death struggles of nature, you become accustomed to all manner of unnerving sights and smells. The lifeless bodies of birds and small furry animals were common and Stuart quickly built up immunity towards these squeamish moments which bordered on morbid fascination. One afternoon when he was 10, Stuart had decided that the time had come for him to venture deeper into the trees. He had always stayed near the house, as the dire warnings of his granny against the darker regions of the woods had scared him into obedience. Yet, for whatever reason, defiance drove him onward that day. He put all of his fears to one side and strode confidently into the densest part of the wood. Bracken tore at his legs as he pushed further onwards. The trees here seemed older, more sinister and twisted than the ones close to the village. Rural Colmore was a place of dark myth and superstition, and he told himself this fact over and over to quiet the nagging voice in his head that told him to run. A strange groan stopped him in his tracks. Branches twanged and the leaves rustled. Stuart stopped dead in his tracks, his eyes wide and his ears pricked. He crouched down and parted the patch of overgrown weeds in front of him. Before him lay a clearing. It wasn't large, but it seemed to be a rough circle of ground where nothing seemed to grow. The branches of the encircling trees seemed to knit together, creating a fence around the patch that reminded Steve of a police cordon. Though it was only mid-afternoon, it was already a dark and gloomy place, as though the canopy above worked to repel all light. 
With a tremendous scuffle, a large badger burst through the undergrowth and into the clearing. The injured Mustella wheezed and groaned as it scraped its limp hind legs behind him. His black and white flanks were streaked crimson, and it had clearly been engaged in a fierce territorial dispute. Stuart watched in grim fascination as it dragged itself into the clearing and collapsed. After a moment of laboured breathing, it expired. He stood, still gazing at the broken creature. He had never seen a badger before, except on TV. Cautiously, he picked his way towards the carcass. Suddenly, the corpse started to ripple and undulate, and Stuart watched in horror as the badger was consumed from the inside out within seconds. A swarm of ferocious insects from under the soil had burrowed into the animal, making swift work of the, mustela, of the muscle and organs. The skin was next to be devoured, followed by the bones. They blackened and cracked, then melted away like stop-motion footage of decomposition. It was a horrible sight. Horrible, yet fascinating. After this display, Stuart found a new fascination. He would gather roadkill or other carcasses and deposit them in the clearing. The strange insects would, without fail, devour his offerings. It felt good, like he was contributing to the nurturing of the woods. Instead of letting the dead rot away in the elements, he would recycle them to feed the woods. He had never heard of or seen creatures like the ones that dwelt under the soil. They looked more like prawns or small lobsters than the usual beetles and centipedes. He scoured books on entomology, but couldn't even find a close match. He spoke to his teachers about the unusual creatures, but of course they didn't believe him. Nobody ever did. And he knew he would need solid proof. Armed with a dead mouse and a jam jar, he set off to get his proof. But unfortunately, the creatures had one hell of a bite. All he walked away with that day was a wound which soon turned septic and earned him the unflattering nickname of Green Fingered Fowler. Stuart's visit to the clearing became an almost daily thing as he became more and more withdrawn from the rest of the village. He kept the insects fed using mice that his granny's traps had caught, but the supply of fresh cadavers soon ran dry. This is when the dreams began. The dreams were always the same. Stuart would find himself in the woods feeling safe and appreciated. The branches would part for him like magic. For the first time since his parents bailed, he felt wanted and loved. The seasons would shift and flicker past in seconds, and soon his feeling of well-being turned into one of crippling hunger. A sonorous, insectoid voice would plead for food. It would promise him everlasting friendship, and every night, Stuart would wake in a cold sweat with painful cramps in his guts. The forest was hungry, that much was certain. But what was Stuart to do? He scoured the village and its surrounding environs for tasty treats, but it was all to no avail. The dreams got worse and worse. The pain in his stomach became less bearable with every passing day. He didn't know what to do. Then one night, it happened anyway. He had gone to sleep feeling lightheaded from hunger, despite having eaten both dinner and supper. That night, however, he didn't dream. The next thing he knew was that he was shivering from the cold. Clad only in his Batman pyjamas, he was kneeling in the woods. The only light came from a sickly looking moon as he gazed down at his hands. The pale light shining on the sticky substance on his hands made them look black. Before him in the clearing lay a canine cadaver that looked suspiciously like Jim. Jim was his neighbor, Mr. Carter's beloved spaniel. And next to the rapidly devoured animal lay a two pound lump hammer. It didn't take a genius to figure out what must have happened. Soon the body was gone. And so was the feeling of hunger. Horrified by what he must have done, Stuart picked himself up and ran home. He stopped at a small pond to clean his hands first. Then he slipped back inside unnoticed and quickly fell back to sleep. The following morning, it was though it had never all been a dream. 
If it wasn't for the posters announcing Mr. Carter's missing dog, Jim, which were attached to lampposts and flapping in the morning breeze, then he could have imagined that it didn't happen at all. Sadly, it did. His guilt was offset, however, by a great feeling of warmth, of inner contentment, of love. His dreams returned to joyful ones, and his stomach returned to normal. The respite wouldn't last. Soon the forest was hungry again. This time he knew what he needed to do. He started small, a rabbit here, gerbil there, but it quickly escalated. The neighbourhood soon became a fluttering mass of missing posters for beloved cats and dogs. Stuart tried to space his feedings out, but the woods were insatiable. They demanded more. Not long after Stuart's 15th birthday, they got what they wanted. The first one was an accident. First ones often are. In the preceding year, against all predictions to the contrary, Stuart had found a friend. Darren was new to the area, and as a result was also shy and awkward. His parents' concern for his safety bordered on the neurotic, and he was soon bullied for being a mama's boy. Stuart lived across the street, and the two boys quickly bonded over their love of comic books and WWF wrestling. They were in the woods one day when tragedy struck. They were wrestling together out the sight of the village, and Darren had Stuart in a tight headlock that was quickly wearing him down. Then from out of nowhere, Stuart had an unnatural surge of strength. He lifted his friend aloft and dumped him over his shoulder. Stuart's vision blurred and swam as his friend went up in the air. And as he turned, his gut clenched in horror. Darren was rocketing headfirst into a pile of stones like a dart to a board. Stuart watched as his friend's cranium was split wide open. He gagged and retched as the vis viscous concoction of blood and brain fluid poured out onto the ground. And it was so much worse than what happened with animals. The metallic stench of blood was overpowering. Stuart shook and rocked on his heels, hugging his knees. Darren was dead, killed instantly when his skull met the un unforgiving stone. A strange stillness fell over the woods. Not for one second did Stuart contemplate going for health, help. An inner voice told him what to do, so he grabbed Darren by the ankles and dragged him deeper into the woods. Once at the clearing, he rolled his friend into the centre and looked on icily as the insects got to work. It took them just 15 minutes to completely eradicate Darren's corpse. All that was left was some clothes and some personal items that hadn't been soiled by body fluids. Anything that had been had been consumed, even cloth. Stuart gathered up the remnants and sunk them <laughs> and sunk them deep into the mud at the pond. Once his hands were clean, he snuck home, quickly changing into clean clothes. It was, by now, right about the time that Darren's parents usually got home. Stuart sauntered across the street and casually asked if Darren could come out to play. His parents instantly panicked when they couldn't find their child, and they went into a frenzy. Stuart showed Darren's father where they usually hung out, and at no point was he implicated in his friend's disappearance. It was as though some kind of force was controlling his actions, keeping him safe and guiding him. Soon a poster of Darren appeared amongst those of Tiddles and Rex, but Stuart never felt guilt over the, effect, the event. After all, Darren's death was an accident. All he did was recycle the body. The woods were finally satiated and were quiet for the rest of the summer. Though as winter set in, the hunger pangs returned with a vengeance. Now in his 20th year, Stuart had the blood of many on his hands. Every time it was the same. He would vow that this one was the last, that the woods would have to find another feeder. He would try to resist the call of the woods. But somehow it would always get its way. The first few, or local people, were dispatched during blackouts or attacks of somnambulism. It was, it was the only way to relieve the crippling pain in his abdomen. 
The local victims, along with all the vanishing pets, soon raised panic to a fever pitch. Some amongst the village talked of the beasts of Bodmin, while others talked about cults and rituals. A few even blamed the rabbit warren of tin mines that riddled, riddled the area, and this theory quickly gained traction when hikers and farm livestock began vanishing. It was as though the ground had just opened up and swallowed them. <laughs> In a way, it had. As time progressed and Stuart got a car, he took his hunt for suitable nourishment for the forest to nearby Battles Cove. The docks were awash with junkies and prostitutes, both of which were easy to lure back to his home with dispatch. His ground had long since passed, leaving him with the house by the woods. Unbeknownst to Stuart, a task force had been set up in Battles Code CID to deal with the plague of disappearances. Top brass were convinced they had a serial killer on their hands, and the wheels of fate were quickly turning against Stuart. While he was at work one fateful day, D.I. Baker led an operation to search the woods near High Bend. There had been many such searches, but the small muddy pond had never been dredged thoroughly. Baker narrowed the start of the horrors to the vanishing of young Darren and decided to start at the beginning. They uncovered a veritable treasure trove of evidence. They soon found keys, wallets, mobile phones and handbags that were all linked to the missing people. The items were taken to the station and examined. Stuart's undoing was a red plastic handbag. A woman, matching the description of a missing prostitute, was caught on a CCTV camera carrying said handbag as she got into his car. This and his proximity to the pond and woods made him a per person of utmost interest. Stuart returned home to a surprise that day. There was a body in his bath. He had no recollection of how it got there, but this had recently become the norm. The woods had stopped cajoling him to kill and had just started taking control of him whenever it was hungry. The village was swarming with police, and he knew that at some point they would ask to take a look inside his house. The only chance he had was to get rid of the evidence. The weather was fierce, and night had dropped like a hammer. He dressed in dark clothes and hoisted the emaciated body of the poor unfortunate person over his shoulder. He ran full pelt through the trees, quickly dropping the body in the clearing. Once the insects had done their grisly work, he gathered up anything that the bugs didn't want and headed to the pond. D.I. Baker hammered on Stuart's door to no reply. He had gotten a swift warrant for Stuart's arrest and had instructed the police with him to smash the door in. Stepping inside, Baker was taken aback by the interior. All the furniture and fittings had been crafted from fallen branches and chunks of lumber. The carpentry showed no finesse, and it had just been cobbled together with a few wonky nails. Stuart had gone as far as gluing sticks and leaves to the walls and ceiling, effectively bringing the woods home with him. The two young officers guarding the pond stared in disbelief as the sodden, bloody, muddy form of Stuart Fowler, had who had emerged through the trees carrying a pair of knee-high boots and a length of hair extensions. Stop right there, one of them bellowed as the other shone his flashlight into Stuart's bewildered eyes. With inhuman force, he launched the boots at the officer holding the light. They hit him square in the chest and knocked him off balance. As he toppled backwards into the pond, his colleague gave chase. Stuart knew these woods better than he knew his own hands. They were part of him. They were his home, his friend and parental substitute. They were all he needed, his whole world. He sprinted through the undergrowth, weaving between branches and hopping over roots. The rain continued to pelt down and thunder rattled his teeth. Lightning flashed and the branches whipped wildly. He raced onwards towards the clearing, but the policeman kept pace. Despite Stuart no Stuart's knowledge, his pursuer was in much better athletic condition. As the constable neared his quarry, Stuart slipped on some mud, falling forwards just as he reached the clearing. Stuart screamed as the insects burst through his clothing and into his flesh. The policeman skidded to a stop, his hand over his mouth in horror. Blood burst from Stuart's mouth as the parasites consumed his innards. 
The policeman scrambled back towards the village in a haze of panic and horror, screaming himself hoarse. He collapsed outside the church, banging on the stout oak doors as he begged for salvation. The case of the high bend disappearances was quietly closed, and the public was assured that the nightmare was indeed over. Though they couldn't elaborate as to what had really happened, certain whispers reached the anxious public. The constable who saw Stuart's return to nature never recovered his sanity and currently resides in a mental hospital where he constantly gibbers about the strange insects in the wood and the hungry earth. Those of a certain age remembered the words of the strange old woman who lived in the house next to the woods. They recalled her saying that the woods were cursed and that dark, furtive things lurked within them. The woods were once again shunned by the local God-fearing folk and every care was taken to keep their children out of the trees. Because deep down they knew that all it would take for the destructive cycle to begin anew was for another lost child to make the woods their home. The end. Thank you. Okay, that was uh, a matter of recycling. And that was from the anthology, It Pulls From The Forest. Uh, there is details down below of how you can get it. It's available on Amazon and things like that. And like I said, at the, at the top of this segment, um, this weekend there will be uh, uh, I'm confused here. <laughs> there will there will be a um, sorry. Yeah, there will but there is a discount this this week weekend. Uh, yeah, it's available for 99 cents this whole weekend. And also that um, if you comment under this, which this is what I'm confused at, it doesn't either nobody has posted or there is no comment. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I say, if you want a, a free, if you want to be in with a chance of getting a free copy of this uh, this book, then all you have to do is comment underneath the video saying uh, what scares you the most and that is the way to do it uh yeah i was going to do a q a but i can't actually see any questions in fact i can't actually see anything at the minute uh, could somebody just do something to make sure this is working <laughs> uh ah there we go thank you archer yeah glad you uh glad you enjoyed that yeah excellent like i say anybody want if you want to be in with a chance to win the uh a free paperback copy of it course from the forest just comment in the section it this this will be open for 24 hours from the start of this so you've got till sort of you know <laughs> 23 and a half hours now that, thanks mike i'm glad you enjoyed that uh yeah so does anybody have any questions about that story i mean that that one that one came purely out of a desire that i had to write a, a much darker piece because i've got two pieces in um a course in the forest and the other one is very much more what i do a lot of which is more more kind of more kind of a romp you know uh i wanted to do a really dark psychological piece because i've always i've always found the, the whole sort of you know that kind of psychological aspect of like serial murders and, and things like that to be uh to be very intriguing um so yeah that's basically where that came from uh, there's no other place than that uh yeah <laughs> yeah i'm just waiting for a question i don't think i'm gonna get one um that's all that's cool uh yeah so like i say um it was released on Wednesday. It calls from the forest, and since then it became it went to number one in the uh, uh, the number one horror new release, which is really good. You know that's excellent. Uh, yeah, and if you want to if you want a, an ebook copy of that for ninety nine cents or the English equivalent of, all you need to do. Ah, oh, hang on, no question. Do I write your Write stories fully formed. Do I know it's going to pan out or do I make it up? Um, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, Mike wants to know whether my where I plan all my 
stories out basically or i write them as i go along uh it's very much i didn't realize there was a term for it until i joined another author group for um, a different publisher and people like me are referred to as pantsers apparently like i assume it's from flying for the seat of the pants uh yeah i mean i tend to just have an idea and then i'll just sit down and start doing it and off i often don't know how things are going to end till i get there uh yeah some things I, like larger pieces like the velas and things like that i tend to plan like the bare structure of it but as far as like character arcs and things like that i just make that up as i go along really um yeah a lot of what a lot of my writing comes in a kind of stream of stream of consciousness where i'll yeah i'll just sit <laughs> just literally i'll sit down and just go till something's written yeah that's a good question that um now because it, it's interesting because i'm i'm um talking to other people and there's another guy who can't he literally can't do anything until he's the exact opposite of me he can't do anything until everything is completely mapped out like <laughs> graphs and charts and post-it notes and all that kind of stuff and i tend i tend to just a lot of, i get a lot of ideas in my sleep and things like that and i tend to wake up with an idea and then just go write it um i know people like me annoy people like that <laughs> so sorry <laughs> Uh, yeah, like I say, if if you want to be in with a shout of winning a paperback copy of it, Course of the Forest, you, all you need to do is comment what scares you the most. Okay, that will be open for another 23 hours or something. Uh, okay. Ooh. <laughs> Jay's just commented. <laughs> um, sausage. Uh every time uh yeah uh, like i think that's probably going to be it for questions it doesn't seem to be uh many coming through i think i've covered most things uh well anyway thank you for tuning in again uh and i hope people enjoyed it and i hope you enjoyed that story uh, like i say i'm particularly pleased with the two in in that are in with it calls from the forest because they are two very different pieces and they are basically the two ends of the spectrum of my writing like one's kind of a romp and rah and the other one's kind of dark and uh, yeah uh like i say again look below there will be things of how you can get hold of a copy it's on sale this weekend and if you want to be in with a shout you've got 23 hours to tell us what scares you okay and tune in in next time uh when i will be reading the metamorphosis cube from the death and butterflies anthology Okay, well, thank you again for tuning in, and I hope, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.